Hey everyone. This is a special episode of Contact for the episode 13, magical number. I am going to narrate my visit to the planet Neptune. Yes. So it was a little bit special because it was a little bit special because um, I was in time dilation. So I went for the whole day, but I was brought back only one hour after I left. That's how it works in space. You know, time is relative to gravity and densities. I could not take photos, although I wanted to, because um, um, I wasn't allowed. So that's it. And anyway, the travel I did was in the fifth and sixth densities. And also, as you will discover, interdimensional. As I wanted to get this information as quick as possible to you, I haven't made a super production video because, you know, it takes time. I do everything myself. I buy videos on iStock and uh, video se sections and, uh, you know, I try to make something nice. So I did something all right, and but I didn't put too much effort into it because I don't have time and I wanted you to have it fast. And I didn't do it yesterday because I was a bit tired with the the, the travel, you know, uh, space travel and shifted densities and etc. Um, it's a bit um, tiring for the body. And, you know, and I'm not young. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, I'm not young and I'm not, uh, you, you know, uh, trained like military. I'm just um, me, you know, so it's it's a bit tiring. You know, I need uh, always a day to recover physically. So that's why it's coming up only today. Enjoy, follow my story, imagine, visualize, and try to imagine where I am describing and taking you. And uh, well, enjoy. On July 25, 2022, I got my lift to Neptune. The actual trip lasted the whole day, but I was brought back in time to only one hour after my departure. Thorhan gave me notice in the morning and he picked me up in the middle of the afternoon, which is an unusual time. He never sets a precise time for safety reasons. I was beamed on board a scout ship of the Federation and Seladion was there, my friend pilot. Always sparkly with joy and energy. The lads invited me to the command room and I noticed straight away that the settings were sort of upgraded. The walls were rounder and the materials more smooth and luminescent white. Siladion invited me to sit in the co-pilot seat and I, I politely declined, not sure about my skills. Come on, said Torhan. You've done that before. You will enjoy it. All right. As I took place in the seat, it adapted to my body shape and I let out a little cry of surprise. I know it does that, but the sensation is always fun. Thoran let me place my arms on the inside lower arm rest. The external ones have all the commands and I am not touching that. I extended my hands forward and opened my palms above the two hexagonal green glass pads. 
preparing myself mentally for the interface with the ship, taking a few deep breaths. As I explained it in my previous books, it works via DNA resonance. We are ready, said Siladion, running his long fingers through holographic screens. Thorhan briefly waved his hand above a console and a third seat materialized from the ground. Wow, I exclaimed, that's a new feature. The latest model of scout ships, Thorhan answered while sitting in the middle chair. We've integrated some technology from our intergalactic friends. It's awesome, Seladion added with enthusiasm. The target is set, Elena. You only have to give the impulse power. Whenever you're ready. I took a deep breath. As long as I wasn't in charge of the navigation, it was all good. The Mars incident traumatized me slightly which I described in my book, We Will Never Let You Down. So I applied my palms on the interface pads with confidence. I instantly received in my mind a wave of frequencies and light geometrical patterns. It was the artificial consciousness of the ship interfacing with my mind. I remember the first time I did it, it was the Mars episode, when I nearly crashed the ship. Consciousness interface requires skills and training, which I'm not excelling into, or at least not yet. So I gave the impulse by thought, projecting the ship ahead into the void of space. And I only had to focus on keeping the pace as the trajectory to Neptune was automatically set. A few minutes later, we already approached the magnificent blue planet and its thin, elegant silver rings. Without me doing anything, the ship stopped. I understood that we had reached the target point, a location in high orbit of Neptune. The part of the ring exposed to the distant sunlight was glittering like silver and showed a rusty reddish color in the shadow side. I didn't manage to count how many concentric rings were there, but it seemed probably five or six. Well, the show was magnificent. This is when it happened. The flashing vision of a strange creature looking like a cross between the Tangri and an amphibian appeared in my head for the duration of a second, then another one, and a third one, and the fourth looked different. I tensed up in my chair, quite frightened. Thoran laid a calming hand on my shoulder. They are the Koldasi, he said with a reassuring voice, an interdimensional collective of different races. How strange, I said. They live on Neptune, on two planets of this system, Nara and N2. Venus and Neptune? Yes, Thorhan replied. They are telepathic only, Seladion said, and they can scan all the ships on approach. It is a normal procedure, more about curiosity than security. Sorry for the fright, we should have told you. Surely they should have. Seladion took over the navigation from there, and our ship flew towards a part of the bigger outer ring where the dust particles agglomerated to form a field of small rocky asteroid. It was weird. There was located a huge mining station. Our ship entered a landing bay. The interior was dimmed and looking like how you can imagine a sci-fi mining station in the outer rings of the distant planet. Thorhan asked me to put on an environmental suit, one of these white, translucent, very light space suits. He pressed a button on it near the neck, and a transparent helmet appeared out of the metallic color. 
I am unable to explain how that worked. I had gravity boots also with, with it and uh, a large density belt. Once all three of us were equipped, we went out of the ship into the buzzy landing bay. As we walk through it towards a higher platform, Thoran explained to me that this facility was built by the Galactic Federation of Worlds a very long time ago, long before the Terran Wars at the time when this star system was facing other conflicts. Since the time you are mining these rings, I asked, there shouldn't be any more rocks in it? <laughs> Thoran laughed. We are extracting a very precious metal, Seladion said, in small quantity, respecting the gravitational balance of the rings and the moons. Anything up here affects everything down there on the planet. We climbed onto a semicircular platform that led to another hangar. This is my ship, Seladion said, as he pointed at the discoidal vehicles shaped a bit like a bell. That's a cargo, I asked, perplexed. Yes, Seladion replied. Okay, I was expecting more like a um, sort of long sort of craft. Why does the Federation mine here, I asked. I mean, they don't own this system, right? So do they have the right to do that? Seladion turned back to face me. His bright blue eyes were luminous. This is not the Federation, he said. This is for the Kolda Sea. We mine for them the organ they need to maintain their density stable here against free access to their portal. The Kolda Sea, intervened Thorhan, are in this system for so long that they are considered as natural residents. It's like if they have always been here, but in a parallel dimensional plane. Come and meet them, Seladion called to me from the footbridge, leading down to a lower level where the strange cargo ship was parked. We entered. The interior of the ship indeed was from a different epoch, older construct. It could have been earth-made, although it was not. As the airlock closed, we could remove our helmets. Thorhan did it for me. Interestingly, I have claustrophobia, but wearing this helmet was just fine. It was very light and the air was flowing great and fresh inside, adapted to my physiology. At my great surprise, not the first and not the last in this peculiar adventure, the ship didn't take off, but shifted, dimensional plane. Suddenly, the station wasn't there around us anymore. But Neptune, with its rings, was still there. But no station? Interesting. Our craft slid smoothly towards the surface of Neptune. Time was also felt differently, more expanded. What a magnificent blue color. So soothing. As the craft descended through endless layers of clouds, the light dimmed very quickly, in a strange foggy twilight, the surface of a calm ocean appeared to our side. The ship hovered for a while over it, until an odd metallic structure became visible, emerging from the water. These oceans are teeming with life, said Thorhan pensively. My heart bounds in my chest at the sound of these words. What an excitement, a thrill, to hear this. It was nearly bringing tears to my eyes. I would have loved to see all these creatures under the surface of this mysterious ocean as our ship hovered over it. Our craft dived under the water as we approached the metallic location tower, and then it was total darkness. 
the lights of a floating city, composed with the spheres of different sizes, soon appears. Once again, the vision of the Koldasi being flickered into my mind. The ship entered one of the spheres and the large airlock closed behind us. We flew through three series of other airlocks until we weren't anymore in the water, but in a normal, breathable atmosphere. Unlike when visiting mining station, we didn't require to wear environmental suits and helmets. I only put on one of these blue smart suits with a frequency belt. As soon as we stepped onto the ramp of the ship, my belt generated instantly a density force field and I felt the suit tightening my body to regulate the blood pressure. It felt to me when I was on Alnilam, in the sixth density of physicality, the shapes of the architectural structures around me seemed blurry, so I am not able to give an accurate description. But when the Koldasi people approached, I could detail them quite clearly. It seemed they were a collective of different races, and they truly were all living in the same dimensional plane. I had never been to a parallel dimension before, and this was a whole new experience for me. Most of these beings were about 5 to 5.5 feet tall, and the most prominent race was looking like the Trappist one, Tangri, with big round eyes. There was something about their features that looked amphibian. They had two sets of long tentacles coming from either sides of their head, waving as they moved. They had clothes on of different fashions and their skin was light green with some blue shades. They had four thick fingers at each hand, although they were not of a great genome, but a species of their own. Among them, I could see also humanoid races with other features, but more or less, all of the same average size, around five feet tall. They felt and they behaved very friendly. Two of them approached me and took me by the hands, inviting me to come with them somewhere. I threw a look at Thoran to check if he encouraged me to follow them. I took his compassionate smile as a positive answer. Thoran and Seladion came along anyway, keeping close to me. The Koldasi showed me their facility and I need to say, I recall very strange memories of translucent, iridescent walls. Walking on water and moving through curtains of shiny bubbles. These people were very joyful and light-hearted, exactly what it feels when in contact with higher density of consciousness. Time dilated tremendously and it seemed to me that we spent a whole day with them. In fact, when we got back to the mining station to reintegrate our scout ship, Thorhan told me that only one hour had passed in this dimension. I was very impressed. I was brought back to Earth and, straight after, open my computer to write this extraordinary story of my visit on Neptune.